help you? Yes, hi, how are you? Uh, listen, I've got a pet here. I really could use some help. He's an unusual animal. I mean, I heard you guys took care of unusual animals here. Is this a dog? No. We don't take care of dogs. We just take care of birds, exotic mammals, and reptiles. He's definitely an exotic animal. No. I mean, it's his time of the month. He's, his hair's not no. growing in right. He's howling. Something's definitely wrong with him. I mean, he's a great animal. Uh, just need a little he might help be right the now. most exotic animal I've ever seen. Why don't you come on in? That's a great compliment. Come on in, buddy. in after business hours. I know you were closed when we got here. And I love the way you handled my little buddy. Can I ask you something? How much would it be to neuter a werewolf? Dr. Rolf is an amazing veterinarian. She only works on exotic animals. So if you've got an exotic animal or you know someone that does, you might want to stick around and listen to what this gal has to say. Because she really knows her stuff. She's been in business for many years. She's got a multitude of articles written about her. She's given seminars in as far away places as Iceland and Japan, and she's board certified. Trust me, this lady knows what she's talking about. Welcome to the show, Vanessa. Thank you, glad to be here. You have the most incredible facility that I have ever seen. Please, tell us why did you paint everything like jungle scapes and desert scenes and tropical stuff, and you know, why do you have everything done the way that you did and the colors that you picked to do it? Well, it they're, they're natural environments that these birds or other exotic animals see, you know, that that's their, where they're from. And so I'm doing the best I can to make them feel like they're in a, in a, um, um, a an home environment. tropical environment. Right, exactly. Now here's a question I've been wanting to ask you. Um, I really dislike any kind of food that comes out of a box. I don't like it for me and I don't like it for my pets. Can, can I go to a grocery store and just go into the fruits and vegetable area and pick out different varieties of fruits and vegetables and give them to my bird? A lot of natural foods are good for them. There's a lot of vegetables that are really great. Broccoli, carrots, asparagus. You can give broccoli and carrots to, to a bird. Yes, absolutely, most birds. And that's really good for them? It is very good for them because of the phytochemicals and the um, enzymes and all the nutrition that comes with that, and the fiber too. Tell us about a bird's eyes. You were telling me something really cool about a bird's eyes and people would probably you know, appreciate hearing that. Birds have the ability to consciously control their iris muscles. So when they make them bigger and smaller, it's their best way to communicate that they're upset. They can't smile or frown. They don't have facial muscles. So they're telling another bird their temperament. Right. And if you're smart, then you can read your bird and figure out, am I gonna get bitten or is he just gonna snuggle? Exactly, exactly. It, it's a signal to tell you that He's very excited about something, either very angry, very happy, or, or... But it's an obvious emotional pattern, so if you pay attention to your bird's eyes, you can learn what he feels. Exactly. What is a definite no-no with a large bird, you know, something that people should watch out for that you've seen that's kind of common? Well, several times a year we have cases where birds were left outside in cages, and raccoons actually will reach in and yank off the limb through the bars of the cage oh, with their God. grasping hand they'll rip off the limb leaving the bird behind on the in the cage now without a limb and sometimes we've actually seen multiple limbs ripped off they lose a lot of blood oh my god and they're big hunks of flesh that are open these birds are come in very very critical condition yes they do yes they do and you're able to save them some of them some of them but the mortality rate is is very high and what's scary is that sometimes people don't find them until the next morning oh and then they're just hanging on literally by a thread is there something that people can use at home a product that's easy to obtain that that helps stop bleeding and makes a wound clot well especially for the tips of nails if they're broken or cut accidentally or a tip of the beak that's broken off with a fall uh, those types of things are best treated with styptic powder, otherwise known as quick stop. It's a powder that can be pressed into the wound and it stops the bleeding right away. It just can't be used for open wounds. 
I almost forgot to talk about the rabbit. You could quite possibly be the coolest veterinarian on the entire planet. Tell us about the rabbit and how late did you stay there to save this little animal's life? I was there until 1.32 a.m., two nights in a row. And you set up a web camera next to his cage so when you went home, you could still look yes, at the rabbit. Yes, exactly. Oh my God, tell us about the treatment you did on this poor rabbit, this poor thing. Well, this rabbit was attacked by a dog and uh, it got the face and caused a great deal of hemorrhage into the nostrils, bleeding into the nostrils. Which meant it could have suffocated. Right, because rabbits can't breathe through their mouth. See, and nobody would know that. They are obligate nasal breathers, which means that if you if you shut down the nose, they can't. They can only get maybe wisps of air through their through their mouth. And so this rabbit was in very severe distress with this amount of fluid and swelling that developed due to the facial trauma. And I vacuumed blood out of the nostrils, provided it oxygen, gave it antibiotics to keep it from getting an infection gave it anti-inflammatories to take down the swelling that developed in the neck, which was also cutting off the windpipe. Oh, it was terrible. It was just laboring to breathe. Oh, my heart went out. So how is the rabbit now? I've been a, I've been away from your place for a couple days now. The, the rabbit went home. Oh, well. good, good, good. And the ferret that was a little bit sick, the ferret, he looks like he was starting to come around. He, how did he do? He did great. He's putting on um, literally two, one to two ounces of body weight a day at this stage. He went from being a little sad the first day when I came in and photographed him to the next day. He just looked like a different guy. <laughs> he, was, he was already starting to show signs and he was coming around. And three days later, he looks like he's double-sized. Tell us about the smallest animal you've ever performed surgery on. We've done abdominal surgery on hamsters to take out liver cysts. Oh my God, you did surgery on a hamster. Yes, yes, and taking the standard ones are uh, removing an abscess or a... Um, what is the life expectancy of a hamster, if I might ask? Two, maybe two and a half years. And some kid just says, Mommy, I don't care what it costs, fix them. Yes, oh. sometimes it doesn't matter that a hamster costs five dollars, it's that hamster. It's, it's that not, hamster. That's not replaceable. Wow, that is really cool. And of course, you love each one of them. I do, I do. <laughs> Even if they bite me, which they often do. <laughs> which they often do. I know, you call them all by names. And when they come in, you know the names of every one of them. It's <laughs> crazy. They're like your, they're your little friends. <laughs> yes, they really are. Is there some kind of like preventative measures that a person can take to make sure their exotic animal is okay and healthy? You know, even though it seems okay, like, you know, people go for a once a year physical checkup. Can you actually do that with an animal? Well, there are viruses I can check for. There's all sorts of bacteria that I can check for. I can screen the bird for liver disease, kidney disease, um, make sure their electrolytes are fine in their bloodstream, make sure their calcium and phosphorus are balanced and also to um, check so the proteins. A simple blood test can tell you that much about a bird. Yes, exactly. Which is, which is really great because a bird can't tell you what's wrong. It can't tell you I've got this terrible headache that I've had for a month now. Would you please give me the right food? Right. You know, and you could find it. And if it had liver disease or something like that, you could nip it in the bud and, and possibly save the bird's life. Right, before it's had a chance to really root itself in. It, one of the things that happens with hepatitis in people is that they feel fine until they need a liver transplant. So this would be like the, the, the quiet. The same type thing. This would be testing the disease when it's in the silent part of its problem rather than now the bird is in failure because you can't do a liver transplant on a bird. Wow, not yet, but you're probably working on it, right? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if you can do a hysterectomy on a uh, hamster, <laughs> I don't see why quadruple bypass is out of the question for an African gray. <laughs> what about tarantulas and crazy animals like that? You know, I guess it's not really an animal. It's, a, you know, an arachnid, but, I mean, do you, do you actually see them? Or? I, I, I do. I see them on occasion. Oh, my God. And the... Um, Tell me when they're there so I know not to come. Okay. But uh, one, my last tarantula patient had a cut on its leg that it was really seeping the fluid out that they have. Oh, yeah. And so he was actually, to use the term bleeding to death, it's called uh, something else, but it's 
it's, he would have expired from it. He would have expired from it. So the treatment. Could you put a little super glue in there? Well, that is one treatment. It didn't work. So what I had to do is take the leg off at a joint. And at the next shed, this tarantula is going to grow another segment of, of leg to, to grow back what I just had amputated. I've got to ask you this. I mean, I, I know that you've been bitten and stung by everything that walks, swims, or crawls on this earth. And you are like the Mother Teresa of all animals. What do you get out of this? What is your reward in the end? I think the animal, human-animal bond is just amazing what it does for people, what it does for families, and it is a great way to um, share the world because once you become in tune with your pet, you can really see the world from a different pair of eyes. Very different. And um, so that's one of the things I celebrate at the hospital because it's so important for that um, bond not to be dismissed or made fun of. And sometimes I think people are afraid to call in with a hamster or with a pet rat or with a pet budgie thinking that they might be made fun of because of their love for this animal. So, and sometimes well, people... that is a really unique service you provide. And people will actually say that their coworkers told them, why don't you just stick it, just put your boot on it, or why don't you just let it go, or why don't you, why don't you just put it down the toilet, oh. just as, as, because they don't understand, their coworkers might not understand their bond with this animal. I've had pet rats and I thought they were so cool. <laughs> so yeah, cool. rats rats really make great pets. They are to, like squirrels without furry tails. They are they're and incredibly they're incredibly fun. They're very smart, they're very social, they're very friendly and affectionate. There's nothing that you can't do with a rat, really. My rat would play with my dog. Yeah, absolutely. He would roughhouse with the dog. <laughs> That's incredible. What about the little exotic cool pets like sugar gliders and stuff like that? What are the do's and don'ts about a sugar glider? Well, sugar gliders, temperature for them too, because they're very tropical. They need to be kept at a fairly warm temperature. Um, they are hard to keep, mainly because they need a special diet, which pet stores don't always share that. Um, they also need lots of room because they are jumping animals. They need, they need at least four or five feet across in their cages, that's minimum. So in a typical household, sometimes it's hard to find a cage that size. What are some definite do's and don'ts with ferrets? Well, ferrets are pretty easy keepers overall when they're young. They might get an occasional upper respiratory system infection or a um, little brown of diarrhea, but usually int int until they hit about three years, they're usually pretty healthy as long as you keep them on a good standard ferret diet. Um, However, after age three, they tend to become prone to a number of different cancers. Were they used as a lab uh, subjects, so they bred it into them? We, th we think it's due to some inbreeding, yes. I'm not sure if it was for that or incidental to it. What about uh, animals that are kind of obscure that you really don't see much of, chinchillas and things like that? Do you, do you see anything like that? Yes, here? actually chinchillas we see fairly commonly. They're, they're a reasonably uh, commonly kept uh, pet around here. The big thing about chinchillas as their cousins, the guinea pigs, is that they are very prone to overheating and 80 degrees is really too hot for a chinchilla. And sunlight, even if they're in an aquarium in an air-conditioned room, if sunlight's coming directly through the window, it can, it it, can that, hurt them. That can create a too hot situation, yes. Um, that can, they, they, they are used to very cold temperatures in the mountains of Peru. So they can't handle, you know, being in our, our temperature that we're generally used to, in the, even in the mid-70s, is a little hot for them. Really? Um, you can put fans, you can use a sheet of marble, smooth marble, as a heat sink, they'll lay on it and cool themselves down just by laying on the, on the cold marble. Well, Vanessa, I'm afraid that we're running out of time. It's been really great having you come down to the studio and tell us all these interesting things about your place and your birds and what you do. And Thank we you. really appreciate it. And I'm sure that it's okay for anybody to go onto your website and check it out. Go ahead and tell us your location and your phone number. Well, we are 6147 Lake Worth Road, Green Acres in Florida. Our phone number is 561-964-2121. And believe it or not, Vanessa will actually answer the phone late at night if you have an emergency. 
We definitely have a way to reach me if you need me.